<laughs> yeah, but if you get, if you get shingles, yeah. you'll regret you that. You'll regret that. We will start here in just a couple more minutes. And if how is your little mama doing, Jan? Joining us online on Facebook Live. We'll see you in just a couple minutes. Oh, yes. How is your little mama Debbie's, doing? Uh, she is got getting bigger and bigger. When did she do? Uh, yeah, January 24th. <laughs> That's going to be so much. <laughs> Yes. Are you guys side. just tickled to death? Oh, yeah. Oh, You're yeah. ready? Good. Yep. Yeah. Every Which time daughter is that? The middle one, Fawn. Named after my dad. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, I saw a man that looked like your dad the other day. It always freaks me out when I see somebody that, that yeah. looks like him. <laughs> yeah. They're out there. They are. He would be pretty excited. He is downtown. Um, there's a server problem, so oh, okay. I have to pick him up afterwards. I thought he was arrested or something. <laughs> oh, <my God>. Arrested. <laughs> Chip, really? He's so <laughs> Why do you, why does so she long. laugh I can't believe everything he, he was arrested for where the Minnesota Vikings yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it was the Vikings, yep. Something to do with Vikings. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Said, said, get your freezer clean. Hey, Christy, get your freezer cleaned out. Looks like we might have one more joining us. Hey, Crystal. Looks like you made it back home, huh? I'm back home, yep. Good. How'd it, how'd it go? Um, it went good. Yeah, everything good. went okay. Okay. John, I'm leaving it up to you to decide if we need to throw in another table. I think this is Sonia coming, probably. Well, it's seven o'clock, so let's let's pray and and dive in, okay? Lord, thank you for um, giving us an opportunity to study another book of end times prophecy, and it's so rich with information, Lord. It's a little bit tough, but we uh, we know if you are here in our midst, you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us take away exactly what we need to take away from the book of Zechariah. Lord, I just ask for you to bless our time. Uh, bless those who are not with us. Um, I also want to pray for, for healing for Crystal and for Randy as they're pursuing radiation and chemotherapy. Lord, just make their path clear, and we just pray for healing for them. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, Sonia. Hi. You snuck in there during the prayer. <laughs> well, um, so we're in Zechariah, and I'm going to start with doing a little bit of an intro. And by the way, the last time we've been on break for, what, three weeks, I think, because I had to do some radio shows, which was crazy. But um, those apparently worked out well, and they'll be broadcast on Bot Radio on Sunday mornings. Let's see if I've got this right. Uh, Sunday mornings at 7.30 on BOT um, on October 16th, 23rd, and 30th. And then uh, on the local KCRO, which is 106.5 FM, uh, Mondays at 5.30. So that would be the 17th, 24th, and the, uh, Halloween. And uh, those uh, broadcasts here in Omaha, for those of you who are not in Omaha, in about a week, there will be a link to those radio shows on the Living Word Ministry website under uh, Bible Prophecy Radio. So if you miss it live, you can watch it that way. And I'll probably, if you're friends with me on Facebook, I'll go ahead and try to share that link once they're up as well. So that's that's why we took the three-week break, because I filled in for Debbie Blank and tried to learn how to host a radio program and just talked through Second Thessalonians and the co-host Jackie, man, she's she's wonderful. So, so thankful to have her. Uh, but that's why we took a break. And um, the last time we were together, Carrie and Jordan were trying to decide whether or not to put an offer in for a house. And they put the offer in, the offer got accepted. And so they're in the middle of moving this week and this weekend into their house in Gretna. So that's exciting. Um, but let's go ahead. I just wanted to give you a little reason of why we've been kind of crazy here and taking a break. Let's go ahead and make sure we do an overview of Zechariah. Uh, because if we just start right in, we will not 
get any of it. We will not understand it at all. So I want to take a little time to do an overview, and then we'll dive right into chapter one. So uh, Zechariah is one of the minor prophets. Some people would go, Zechariah, is that even in the Bible? And it turns out it is. It's at the end of the Old Testament. Um, he's a minor prophet. When they say major prophets or minor prophets, what does that mean? Anybody know? Minor prophet means their book is smaller. Major prophet means their book is bigger. They're not minor in the sense of well-knownness. It's just they were less wordy. Their book is smaller. So that's the only reason he's called a minor prophet. He's actually thought of as the most messianic and most apostolic, apostolic of all the writings of the Old Testament, which kind of surprised me. I would have thought Daniel would have been more so than Zechariah, but no, he's, he's right up there with prophecy compared to the other prophets. And um, that's why we want to make sure we hit it before we go on to just various studies through books of the Bible. Since we've been doing this series of end times Bible prophecy, Revelation, Daniel, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Psalm 83, Isaiah 17, Ezekiel 36 through 39, Joel, we, want to, we don't want to miss one, so that's why we're ending with Zechariah. The important thing about Zechariah, um, you know, you get most of the whole end times prophecy equation with Revelation and Daniel, but then there's pieces that of the puzzle that are missing if you don't get into First and Second Thessalonians, where there's also pieces of the puzzle that are missing if you don't do Zechariah. We're going to find things out in this book that completes the end times puzzle that we just wouldn't have had otherwise. So that's that's a major reason we want to we want to go into it. Book of Zechariah, you always want to go. Okay, you know how some books there's there's books that are not in the Catholic Bible. There's books that are just in the Protestant Bible. And what's the reason for that? Well, the reason is whether or not they're considered authoritative, and whether or not it's authoritative is based on did Jesus. And the disciples quote from those books. And if they weren't quoted from those books, they're not considered, you know, they're not the important set of books. Well, Zechariah is quoted 41 times in the New Testament. So it kind of tells you where it ranks, both by Jesus and by the disciples. Um, Zechariah is called a post-exilic prophet, which in simple terms means after the exile. He was doing his prophecy to the Jews after they return to Jerusalem from the exile in Babylon. So post-exilic post prophet. Um, but he wasn't just a prophet, he was also a priest. According to Nehemiah 12, Zechariah was um, a priest of the tribe of Levi. Fred might say, well, no, he's not really a priest if it's the tribe of Levi, because he's not, you know, he wouldn't qualify as a, as a high priest, he would be one of the Levites. But he is considered both a prophet and a priest, just like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Um, his name is very interesting. Whenever we're looking in the Old Testament, we want to look up, we want to go to the Strong's Concordance, and we always want to look up people's names, and we want to look up location names, because there's normally meaning associated with it that, that is something we need to know as far as what we're reading. And, and Ze uh, Zechariah's name means Yahweh remembers. And that's very significant. That's pretty much the overarching theme. Yahweh is remembering the Jews and what's happened to them and is, is about to tell about the blessings that's, that he's going to pour out on them in the future. So Yahweh remembers is the theme and the prophet who is, and I wonder if that's why his name's Zechariah, you know? And neat how that worked out that way. So, he, his contemporaries, the other guys that are working with him, there's Haggai, who was an older prophet. Zechariah is a young guy. He's like a teenager when he starts off. Haggai's an older prophet. Then there's Zerubbabel. Say that ten times fast. He was the governor. And then there's Joshua, the high priest. So those are the names that we're going to see with Zechariah. Now, he returned from Babylon to Jerusalem with a small number of exiles, only 50,000. Sounds like a big number to me, but that was a, a minor amount of compared with all the Jews that stayed in Babylon. Only 50,000 returned, and that was a small number. So he returned, and um, and he was a young man. It's We're told in 
uh, Zechariah 2.4 is quoted as saying, that young man, which can mean a boy or a teenager, so we don't know exactly how old he was, but by that, if they were in exile for 70 years in Babylon, and he's a young man when he's returning, that means he was born in Babylon. And he's still just a, you know, whether he is 15 or 30, obviously born there and still a young person. Um, he was eventually killed in the temple between the altar and the sanctuary because of those who were revolting against anybody who was sharing the word of God. So that's, that's what happened to him. Now, history, just a little bit. We've got to do this or we, we don't get it. I'm, I'm probably one that's more bored with history than most people. But um, you have that sheet. Hopefully you guys have this that looks like this. That I that you've got it right here. Oh, that that I sent to you an email, um, and I, it's just a quick little timeline that I just want to kind of go through. So, uh, and I'm going to start a little further back. Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 BC. Most of you know this, but not all of you were in the the studies with us in Daniel. So after being after Jerusalem was besieged three times. Last siege, 586 B.C., they destroyed the, the King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and his army came in, destroyed Jerusalem, wiped them out, destroyed the temple, and took the remaining Jews with them. Each time they did their little besieging, they took exiles to Babylon. Third time was 586 B.C. when they destroyed everything. And then most of all the people in Jerusalem, except for the very poor in the outskirts, ended up going back to Babylon. Well, that exile lasted for 70 years, and it was prophesied. God told them ahead of time, if you don't turn back to me, I'm going to send somebody to take you, and you're going to go into exile, and it's going to be bad. And he told them this in Jeremiah 25. So he told them this, he told them this, he told them this, they ignored it, and then it happened. Um, that's important for us to know as we get into this first chapter. During the exile, Daniel received a prophecy that the Gentile kingdoms, what's Gentile? What's Gentile mean? non-Jew, non the Gentile kingdoms would rule over Judah and Israel until God set up his millennial kingdom, his kingdom of the God actually ruling on this earth. So when the Gentiles are ruling over Israel and Judah, that's called the times of the Gentiles. Jesus told us about that in Luke 21, 24, that there would be the times of the Gentiles. Well, that started back at this time when Babylon is ruling over the Jews. They're in the times of the Gentiles, okay? We're still in the times of the Gentiles today. The times of the Gentiles will continue until Jesus returns and goes, you know, at the end of the tribulation and then sets up his millennial kingdom on this earth. That's when the times of the Gentiles will end, okay? Um, so what's interesting, though, is the Old Testament prophets didn't know anything about the church. They didn't know anything about the church. They didn't know anything about the church age. They thought it was going to be their period, and they knew that the Messiah was going to come. They knew judgment was going to come. They knew that the Messiah was going to come again, and they knew that there was going to be a period where God would rule on this earth. They didn't know in between that time there was going to be this 2,000-plus period time where the church was going to be established, where God was going to allow Gentiles and then the church age was going to be established. And the reason that that's important is because this book talks about the day of the Lord. What's the day of the Lord? You guys remember the day of the Lord? It's kind of confusing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we all, okay, yeah, we know about it. What is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is a period of God's judgments that encompasses everything from the beginning of the tribulation to the judgments at the end of the millennium. Great white throne judgment all the way through. Judgments, okay? But when when the Old Testament prophets are telling about the day of the Lord, they don't know that there's a church age in between. So the day of the Lord does not apply to the church because the purpose of those judgments of the day of the Lord is for people to repent and turn to God. For those who've already repented and turned to God, the judgments of the day of the Lord don't apply. So when we see in Zechariah that he's referring to the day of the Lord, that's for those who haven't repented, Jew or Gentile, who have not repented and turned to God yet. Make sense? 
Okay, I'll try to cut this short. I just have so much information to tell you guys. Um, let's see. Um, so when we start seeing blessings of Israel in here, the blessings appointed to the Israel, there are people who believe in a concept called replacement theology, which says, oh, the church, you know, Israel's gone. Now the church has come up. So those blessings apply to the church. That is not what scripture says. That is not what scripture says. The blessings that God promised to Israel, he is going to carry out for Israel, to Israel. And we know that from Romans 11. You go read about Romans and read in Romans 11 and you'll see it says God is not done with Israel. He has a plan and blessings for Israel. And we need to know that because that's what Zechariah is about. The plan and the blessings for Israel. Now, there's also plans and blessings for the church, for us, for the people who have beyond that time, who are non-Jew, who trusted in Jesus, there's plans and blessings for us. But those blessings are different from the blessings from the church. There's blessings for Israel, there's blessings from the church. The church has not replaced Israel. These are all little things that we need to know because otherwise Zachariah is just a little confusing. So I've just, I've, I've just uh, fought with it for two weeks. And as I, I wanted to tell you the things that helped me go, okay, I got to remember this. So there's a couple of things. Um, I sent you that timeline. We'll go through that really quick. Just talked about that. Um, 539 BC, Babylon came in um, and, I'm sorry, Babylon was overthrown by Cyrus, who was the Mede Persian by Cyrus and, and Darius the Mede. So they wiped out Babylon. Now it's Medo-Persian Empire that's in charge. Well, then Cyrus gives this decree allowing the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple. That's 538 BC. So temple construction started, but they had opposition. There were people that didn't want them to build the temple. So due to the opposition and just not being close to God, they stopped. They stopped the work on the temple. Well, then after the temple was halted, Haggai, the old prophet, and Zechariah, the new prophet, are kind of commissioned by God to come in and get kind of recharge the people, get them to understand that they need to turn their hearts back to God. And as they turn their hearts back to God, the work that he was establishing for them to do is to get that temple rebuilt. And so as Haggai and Zechariah come in, they start sharing these visions, these prophecies with the people, and they start the work on the temple. And then the temple is completed in 516 BC. Okay, that's where we are. Now, where are we in terms of Zechariah? He comes in after the work has stopped, him and Haggai, they start sharing these prophecies, these visions with the people. They energize the people. The people start rebuilding the temple. That's the first six to eight chapters of Zechariah. And then after that, he's sharing visions and prophecies of what's going to happen way later. Like the prophecies about Jesus' first coming. Prophecies about Jesus' second coming. Prophecies about judgment. So first half is to motivate these guys. Second half is future. Make sense? That's Zechariah in a nutshell that I went really, really fast on. A um, couple other things, and then we'll dive into chapter one here. He sees eight visions total. These visions are, we're given, we're going to see them in chapters one through six. But the visions are all given to him in one night. He, it's like boom, 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 boom. But he takes six chapters to tell us about the visions. And then we have to go through and dissect and understand what they really mean. So it's kind of like on the order of Daniel and Revelation, the, the visions. And I feel like we're not real good at that. We just, what we really want, we, we really, I'm stealing your notes here. What we really want is we want a timeline. And we want a date that says this happened. And then next, this is going to happen on this date. And then next, this is going to happen. That's the way we think, right? That's how our minds work. But instead, there's these visions of this and that. And as Western thinkers, we go, what in the world? What am I supposed to do with that? Well, we've got to get our minds wrapped around the fact that Jews think kind of in picture boards, storyboards. They do pictures. We do timelines. We've got to get our brain off the timeline 
and understand the pictures and ask questions to understand what those pictures mean. Um, so I don't want to go forever on just the overview without anyone else talking. Did anybody else do any study, anything I missed of background on Zechariah that you want to add in? Okay, well, let's dive in. We're going to go through the first six verses of Zechariah 1. This is where he is um, introducing the visions, and, um, and, and these visions are about the promised blessings to Israel if they repent and turn back to God. Do you think God's going to bless them if they don't repent? No. Why would he? So they've got to, they've got to repent. So let's read the first six verses, and I guess I, for the sake of everybody online, I will go ahead and, and do the reading. I normally prefer us, for us to take turns. So I'll read, but you guys have to talk, okay? That's the rule here. All right, first six verses. It says, and I'm using New American Standard, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechai, the son of Edo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you. Some translations say that I will return to you there. Verse 4, Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they didn't listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? Then they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Okay, so this is just introduction, kind of like a background information, but we need to kind of dig through this and understand it. So I sent you guys some questions in email, and I only sent that at about 3 o'clock, so don't feel bad if you didn't get it, but that's where my study was, so it was a little late in getting this done. But first thing we want to do, we just want to dig in and understand this. We're given a time frame right off the bat in the first verse. Why? What do we, when we get a time, when we see a time frame in Scripture, what are we supposed to do with it? I mean, it, it's from a long time ago, so we think, eh, okay, time frame, and we kind of want to ignore it. But the time frame is telling us something important. First, what's important about it is it's not just a story. It's not just a parable. The fact that he's saying, okay, eight month, second year of Darius, well, what does that tell us? This, this is history. This happened. This is real. This is not... This is not just a parable. He's giving us a detailed account of what happened and when it happened. Evidence, I, I don't know if you've ever dealt with a court case, but evidence is admissible in court if you keep a, a log of events with date and time. Date, time, I was here, I did this, this happened. Date, time, I was here, I did this, this happened. He's giving us a log, like a legal log of what happened. So we know that this is evidence of history that really happened. And then Darius. You guys have any idea who Darius is? Can I steal your chart again? Yeah. Okay. So you have this chart also, just so you can see it close. It's on Facebook, and I think I sent it out also in email, okay? Okay. And on this chart, you can see, if you are looking at it closely, that when, um, when Babylon was attacked and taken over, they were taken over by the Mede Persians, which is Cyrus and Darius, uh, Darius the Mede, okay? But that's not the Darius that we're talking about here. It's the second Darius on the chart, which is right here. And his name is uh, Darius the First Histaspes. They always have strange names, hard to say, but it's on that chart that you have. So he ruled from 521 to 486 BC. It was during his reign that the temple work returned 
and was um, that they they resumed it and it was completed. So it's the, not the first Darius with Cyrus; it's the second Darius that's being talked about here in this first verse. Now, we as we go through the books of the Old Testament, um, we would and it's not unusual to see dating. But what's unusual about this? If you think about the Old Testament books, it would be in the second year of Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim's reign, or in the uh, second, second year of Hezekiah's reign. Jewish kings, right? This isn't a Jewish king. This is a Persian king. Darius I, uh, his staspes. Persian king. Why is it being dated by a Persian king? This is a Jew writing to the Jews. He's dating it by this Persian king because there is no Jewish king right there. There's no king in Israel. So this is kind of a huge reminder to the Jews of, wow, our prophet is dating his, his writing by a Persian king, not by a Jewish king. That tells them what? They're in the times of the Gentiles. They are in the times of the Gentiles. There's no king in charge right now, okay? Um, very vivid illustration of that. Um, then, let's see, oh, the other thing I was gonna tell you is that date would have been October 520 BC. And you can look at different translations. Your translation say that, John? It says November. It says November? Okay. October, November. I bet November might be clear. 520 BC. Okay. Oh, here I had that chart right there in front of me. I was stealing yours, Charlie. Um, so then we see that Zechariah is being described. They're not just saying Zechariah. They're specifically saying Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechai, the son of Edo. Why are they describing? in that way. Why don't they just say Zechariah the prophet? Could be that there's more than one Zechariah. But the other reason would be that he's just a young guy. He's not known. So they're having to identify who he is. They can't just say name. That they don't go first name, last name, the third. The names can all be similar. So they're identifying him with his more well-known grandfather, Edo. Edo was well-known. You can go and you can look in 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles and 2 uh, Chronicles and see Edo. We know who Edo is, but we don't know who Zechariah They didn't know who Zechariah is. So they're saying, Zechariah, the son of Berechai, the son of Edo. And son in, in Hebrew just means descendant of. So it doesn't necessarily mean son because it's confusing there otherwise. But, well, who is he the son of? Berechai or Edo? Yes, he's the descendant of both of them. Berechai is the father, Edo is the grandfather. So that's who this guy is. And he's being identified just so that they know who he is. Now, now we see in verse 2, why, why is he doing this? Why is the word of the Lord coming to Zechariah in the first place? that he's supposed to be sharing with these people. What's the purpose? Well, we're told in verse two, what's it tell us? The Lord is angry. The Lord is angry. He's not just angry, he's what? Very angry. He's, yeah, he's very <laughs> angry with his people. Why? Why is he angry with them? They've turned away. For turning away from him, from disobeying, from, from turning away. So he's telling Zechariah to warn the people not to repeat the errors of their forefathers. Remember, they were warned. Everything was going great in Jerusalem. They had uh, plenty. Everything was wonderful. And then he sent the prophet Jeremiah to warn them, if you don't turn back to me, I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to destroy you and take you into exile. He kept having the prophets tell him and tell him and tell him, and they were like, quit telling us this stuff. Everything's wonderful. We've got plenty of food. We've got plenty of crops. We've got plenty of animals. Everything's wonderful. Stop telling all this bad stuff. Well, now he's saying, don't be like your fathers who didn't listen to me. You should get it now. Remember what happened to your to the history? Your fathers, your grandfathers, your, 
Remember what happened because they didn't listen to me? Don't be like them. That's what Zechariah is supposed to be telling them. Um, and what's interesting to me is whenever we see the description of Israel, how does God describe Israel? Old Testament, what does he say? When he's, when he's trying to, you know, it's kind of a slam. It's an adulterous wife, right? Israel's an adulterous wife. Who's adulterous wife? Who? God's, right? God looks at Israel as an adulterous wife. Why? Because Israel turned away from God. Now, what about the church? Who's the church? The church is the bride of Christ, right? What I find interesting is that so many people say, where does God say he wants a relationship with us? Show me in scripture where it says God wants a relationship with us. That's where. When he refers to Israel as his wife, when he refers to the church as the bride of Christ, you cannot come up with imagery of a more intimate relationship than that, right? God wants an intimate, close relationship with us. But we tend to not want that relationship. And they, Israel, they didn't, they didn't get that. And people still don't get it today. God wants a faithful wife, a faithful relationship. And that's, that's what he's telling them that they need to be. Um, now this part in verse 2, the Lord was very angry. We can go back and look at the history of it where it said in 2 Kings 21, you might want to just write that reference down. I'm going to read it. 2 Kings 21, 14 and 15. Then I will reject even the remnant of my own people who are left, and I will hand them over as plunder for their enemies. For they have done great evil in my sight and have angered me ever since their ancestors came out of Egypt. How did, how did they anger him? They kept turning away from him and, and focusing on idols, the sun idol and this idol and that idol and ignoring God. And the picture that was always given in Ezekiel was like a wife cheating on her husband. That's how, that was how God described the emotions he felt from that. So it's really interesting for us to, for us to get what's going on here. Um, all right, before we go on, do you guys see anything else in verses 1 and 2 you want to point out? Anne? Yes, please talk. <laughs> um... <laughs> I thought it was interesting. I went ahead and looked what Barakaya and Ido meant. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. I didn't do that. Yeah, Barakaya means um, Jehovah blesses, and Ido means in his time. So oh. you could read that as God remembers and blesses in his time. You're exactly right. That's really yeah, good. Cool. Yeah, that is yeah. really good. And that's exactly what I mean by the names. We saw that a lot in Genesis, that when we pulled those names out, we got that meaning. So great, Crystal. I'm glad you, glad you pointed that out. Um, now, this, this concept of God wanting relationship is really seen and emphasized in verse 3. Verse 3, therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you. So what do we see there? We see, and, and like I said, some translations it might say, and I will return to you. Return to me, and I will return to you. Wow, amazing grace, right? Because these people, this, they've abandoned God. They've turned away from him. But he still loves. He's still offering grace. He's saying, just, we're, we're going to forget the past. Just return to me, and I'll return to you. Same thing today, right? Because we all sin. We all have our times where we get off track and God is still being long-suffering, waiting for us to return to him and he'll return to us. But there's a time where that won't be the case. He's long-suffering right now because that's not going to go on forever. We don't know how long it's going to go on. We don't know how much longer he's going to be long-suffering. We need to not take advantage of that. We need to realize it and make sure we're leaning in. So, um, let's see. What else? Um, Crystal, you might want to talk about this. 
I'm going to ask you the question. Verse 3, we, what, have, what have we learned about when a word is repeated? What does that mean? It's like putting an emphasis on it. Yeah. If he, if he keeps saying the word, the phrase, over and over and over, there's an emphasis on it. Well, look in verse 3. It says, the Lord of hosts. Let's read that. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me. Declares the Lord of hosts that I may return to you. Says the Lord of hosts. Did you see that repetition in there? I didn't catch it the first couple times I read through it. Why is it emphasizing the Lord of hosts? Why are we seeing that over and over? Well, the words Lord of hosts in Hebrew mean Yahweh Sehabo. Yes. It's um, the Lord of armies or uh, God's angel armies. Yep. Um, there to protect. Um, so again, boy, it's pretty cool. Yes. So she's exactly right. Lord of hosts. It could also be the Lord of heaven's armies. Um, that word there, the Lord of hosts in Hebrew is Yahweh Saboth. You know, there's a whole bunch of different names for God that have different meanings. And so the way that he's choosing to give his name to show his character here is Yahweh Saboth. It means commander of the entire universe, the entire celestial bodies, the, the commander of the armies. And why would they want to hear that? They're, they stopped building the temple because of opposition, because of being attacked, of people not wanting to, to build it. So he's describing himself to them as the Lord of heaven's armies. You return to me, I will return to you. What would that do with them? That would, that would encourage them, right? We've got the Lord of heaven's armies telling us to rebuild he's going to take care of us he's going to take care of us now why should that have meaning to us crystal what'd you tell me yesterday well we are we can be assured that if, if he took care of zachariah it's, it's uh, the same name used uh, when david fought goliath mm -hmm. uh, name of uh, when daniel was in the lion's den he'll take care of us too those angel armies are there for us as well. Yeah, so do you ever feel like God's asking you to, to do something that is bigger than what you can handle? Yahweh Sabot. Yahweh Sabot, the, the Lord of heaven's armies. If he's with you telling you to do it, you don't need to worry. You only need to worry when you're outside of what God tells you to do. If you are in the center of what God's telling you to do, going in the direction he's telling you to do, you don't need to worry about it. And that's something else that Crystal shared. Crystal, can I share a little bit? So Crystal's battling breast cancer. She's been battling it for five years. She was told five years ago that she had six months to live. And she has uh, been battling it using natural homeopathic ways. And that that is starting to, that's caused some issues. So she's got some, some wounds. She's got some uh, spot on her lung potentially a spot in her brain. So she's trying to find somebody who will treat her and she's had trouble finding someone who would treat her. And um, it was about two weeks ago, she was praying and as she was praying, then she got a phone call that ended up giving her some different connections. Now she's going, she, she, Crystal is in Lorraine, Illinois. That's further north from where we're from in Illinois. Now she's going up to Peoria, Illinois to see a doctor who's going to give her radiation and then her randy her husband who also has cancer they're going down to texas and they're going to get some very specialized um, chemo down there in texas and through this time that she was praying and asking for god's guidance begging god for god's guidance it's exactly when the guidance came for this specialized chemo so she's relating that to what she's seeing here of Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of Heaven's armies, is guiding her. She's going in the direction that God's guiding her. She doesn't have anything to worry about. She needs to just keep staying in the center of his will. So how can we apply that to your lives? How can we apply it to our lives? I wish I wouldn't have known this when I, right before I did the radio stuff, because I was praying going, okay, <laughs> I don't know anything about hosting a radio program. I, 
interviewed on it twice, I've co-hosted once, and voila, now I'm supposed to host it. I don't know what I'm doing. So, you know, I did my standard, don't eat or drink for six hours before <laughs> you go in so that everything is nice and calm and, and there's no issues. But I was nervous. I mean, I, was, I made sure I wore light clothes because I was sweaty, my hands were sweaty, my heart was, my heart was racing, and I prayed the whole for a couple hours before saying, all right, Lord, apparently you're the one that's plopped this in my lap, so you're gonna have to speak because my mouth is not gonna work if it's just me, you know? And um, so I texted Debbie today and I said, by the way, how'd those go? Are those, you know, are those, those gonna be all right? And she said, it was so easy to edit because you didn't make any mistakes at all. <laughs> and I went, oh man, <laughs> that was God because I'm not capable. Of that, I am not capable of that. You know, I get sweaty if we're if we go in the other room and there's more people. That was God. We've got to understand, just like they needed to. The Lord of Heaven's armies is the one that will give us exactly what we need when we need it. We just have to lean and we rely on Him. Right, Crystal? Yep, she's not in head. She's got mm -hmm. herself muted again. Okay, you guys have any other thoughts on that? All right, we're going to go on to verse 4, and then, let's see, we're not getting very far. Is it okay that we're going slow? I hope you guys don't mind that we're, we're going slow. You're not talking. I'm the only one talking. Okay, uh, verse 4. God issues a warning. What's the warning about? Well, their ancestors not only rebelled against the Lord, they also ignored the warnings that God sent through the prophets. So God's saying, do not... Be like your fathers. And we know that saying, that, you know, like, like father, like son, like mother, like daughter. He's saying, do not, do not follow the same routine of your fathers. You will fail. You will fail miserably. You will die. You don't want to do this. Come to me now, unlike what your fathers did. Um, do we hear that warning today? I feel like the warning I hear today is, do not be like the world around you. Of course, my parents are, are long gone now, but uh, that's, I just feel like it's don't be like the world around you. The, the world around me, and for me, I mean, I'll be, I share stuff on social media all the time, my little devotions that I, that I write or something about God. And friends that I've had for a long time, they'll unfriend me. They just get sick of me sharing about God or they don't want it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, there's people that we both know that say, gosh, all she ever does is study God's word and talk about, don't we? We know people. We know people that say that. Well, hopefully and, they'll come knocking on your door one maybe, day, maybe we'll I get them, you. Maybe we'll get them back here someday. <laughs> but you know what? If that's my crime, I'm happy to be guilty. If that's what, if, if I am unfriended because I'm focused on God, good. That's, I don't, you know, that, that, fine. Fine. I would rather, um, what's that, uh, what's that expression? I would rather have, um, I'd rather be rejected by the world and loved by God than rejected by God and loved by the world. But you only got one choice or the other. You're not going to get both. So if, if people see me as too focused on God, so be it. I, if that's my crime, that's the crime I want. What the crime I don't want is to not be genuine. You know, to say it and not do it. Or to say it and not live it. Or to not be doing it at all. Um, verse 5 and 6, God gives a historical reminder of why we should ignore the world and heed God's warning. He's reminding this generation that, that Zechariah is talking to that uh, what happened to their fathers? What happened to the prophets? Where are your fathers now? Where are the prophets now? And what does he mean by that? They're all gone. And they're gone because they died of pestilence. They died of the sword, the famine. Because he told them they were going to die of it if they didn't listen to him. And they didn't listen to him, so they died of it. He's reminding them of this. Um, he's also reminding them that the prophets, the messages of those warnings, those prophets, they didn't live forever. So what's that mean? Those warnings, the, the opportunity to repent doesn't last forever. There's a time limit. 
right, right now God is long suffering. He doesn't want any to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. But we don't know what the time is of how long he's going to be long suffering. We don't know when that's going to, when that's going to end, do we? So we, we want to make sure that we're taking every opportunity we can to make sure that we are sharing God's word with others, holding it out, loving people, see others come to him. Um, now, let's see. Um, I want to give you a couple. We're not going to get into verses 7 through 11, but I want to give you something to maybe make note of because we're 743. So let's make note of this. And then we'll start in verse 7 next time, okay? There's eight visions. These eight visions all have the same format. Remember when we were studying Revelation and we were in the churches in, verse, in chapter 2 and 3? And there was a format. There was a condemnation, a condemnation, and you know, all that. Well, there's a format to these visions. First, it starts with introductory words. And then next, it's the description of the things that were seen. And then Zechariah goes, I don't understand. What is this I'm seeing? And then an angel explains, well, what you're seeing is this, and this is what this means. And so that's, that's it. Introduction, and then description of the thing, of the, the vision itself. And then Zechariah saying, I don't get it. What does it mean? And then an angel saying, this is what it means. That's the format of these visions. Knowing the format helped me kind of dissect it and figure out what it was talking about. So next week, we'll start getting into the visions. We'll finish chapter one. We'll get into, we'll start with verse seven. But what, we only got through six verses. We got through background, just six verses. I'm sorry I couldn't shorten that background any without giving you things that I thought you needed to learn or needed to know to, to not wrestle with this like I did. What's something that you can take with you from these six verses? Remember, share with someone else, apply to your life. I think it's God's mercy. Yeah. I mean, when he delights in mercy, right? And he shows it right here. And then through all their sin, just return to me and I'll return to you. And it's literally that easy. Yes. That's great. Yeah. God's mercy. And that's not, that's not what we think of with the Old Testament, is it? No. We think of the Old Testament as this horrible God that's always, you know, beaten up on him. But here, we see God's mercy is love. Yeah. Even in the Old Testament. So that's great. Someone else. Well, I think it's like what you said earlier about if you lose a friend or somebody on Facebook because you're following God. I mean, that's big. And, and we need to understand that that's where the salvation is. It's not in that Facebook friend or that, you know, the earthly friends. Yeah. It, it's, um, we don't want to stop leaning into God because we might lose a friend. But when we see that we're losing a friend, we need, those are the people we need to be praying for. Right. We don't want to be shoving it at them if they're pushing away. But that identifies who we need to pray for. Someone else. John, you've always got a couple things. Yeah, well, it might take away sometimes a little strain, but all through the Bible, all through Scripture, there's examples of God's love. Talk up louder all, so that people... All know. through Scripture, there's examples of God's love, God's mercy, God warning of us, and God wanting us to repent. And I just thought of it, if we look around, and you sort of brought that out when we were doing the program, and people were sick. If you look around now, not only now, if you look around what's happening, God's love is always there. When a group of people get together and pray for something, and that prayer is answered, that's an example of God's love that's not in the Bible. So these stories are being created right now in front of us. Oh, okay. You know, that's really weird that it's happening every day out there. Mm -hmm. It happened to you through the radio show. It wasn't you. You were asking God's oh, help. Yeah. You're definitely. not going to read that here, but we heard it today. Yeah. So be on alert. Look for that stuff because it happens every day. And I, and I would add to that, and I am not doing this, so I need to be speaking to myself. But when we clearly see that God is answering prayer and taking care of us, Crystal, like in your case, we need to write it down. 
because then there comes the next little scary thing that we have to go through. And how do we get to, you know, it's different. You think because you've gone through something else, you're going to trust the next time, but we don't. We try to do it on our own the next time too. We get all scared, we get all nervous, we get all sweaty the next time too. But if we could go back and look at the list of how God has taken care of us in the past, that's going to help us to remember to trust in him for the next uh, little hurdle that we have to, to cross over, right? All right, someone else. Crystal, you have anything? Um, I had just written down that divine wrath leads to the availability of divine mercy and grace. Ooh. Yeah, that's good. Because really, that's the story of Revelation, right? I mean, everybody thinks that Revelation is scary and, and all of this horrible wrath. But the purpose of God's wrath in Revelation is what? Save Israel. To get, to get the unbelievers to, to become believers. Yeah. yeah, the purpose of his wrath is salvation. There are, there's six blessings in Matthew. There are seven blessings in Revelation. Seven different blessings. The goal of the period of God's wrath is to get people to repent and come to him. It's the same goal throughout all of scripture. Turn back to me and I will turn to you. Come back to me and I will come to you. Same goal all the way through scripture. Someone else to take away. Okay, we don't get to leave until one other person gets it. <laughs> no one have anything that you want to say? Sonia, come on. She already said it. She already said it, okay. Yeah. Yep. I said remember too, now that we're talking about it. Like, remembering God's wrath, remembering his mercy and the ways he's worked in our lives because we do forget and we do get scared and nervous again and then it just also just makes me think of we're in the old testament but everything points to jesus it just makes me think of communion and the last supper and you know we're told to remember that's you know we're not told to celebrate christmas or easter but we're told to remember his death and you know i think we're supposed to remember all of these things yeah yeah so that's something else i want you to make note of um as you get into this next passage, you're going to see the angel of the Lord listed. And I'll give you a little spoiler alert. The angel of the Lord is Jesus. It's Jesus in the Old Testament. And so we'll talk about that next time. Um, you'll see it in Zechariah 1, 11. There's where it talks about the angel of the Lord. And you'll go, okay, but how do we know for sure? We know for sure when we get to Zechariah 3, 4. So if you will go through and look at what it says about the angel of the Lord, when you get to Zechariah 3, 4, you're going to see why I say it has to be Jesus. Okay? But we'll talk about that next week, too, which I love. I get all excited I love that about the Christophanies where we see <laughs> Jesus in the Old Testament. Okay? So let's go ahead and, uh, and finish up with prayer. Lord, thank you for... Um, Boy, change in my mind, Lord. Thank you. I've always seen the history of the Old Testament as just boring and not something that applies to my life today. And I was so wrong. Uh, it totally applies to my life today. And there's so much of this that I need to dig in and learn and pay attention to so that I don't repeat the same mistakes, the same sins that have been repeated over and over again. So thank you, Lord, for your message from Zechariah that applies to our life today of how to deal with the world around us and how to make sure we are leaning into you so that you will also come to us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, starting in verse 7 next week, same place. And uh, hope you guys have a great week, Crystal. Hope you have a good a good week. When can you just give us a when does when does the radiation start? Don't know yet. Just had the scans today. They'll call me when he gets his plan built. Okay. So I we're going we're all gonna be praying for Crystal. Thank you soon. so much. Okay. Thank you. So everybody have a good night. I'm gonna go ahead and end the Facebook Live and uh, we'll go ahead and